So today's talk is entitled, When Hearing M-O-N-D-A-Y Looks Red, When Seeing 5 Plus 4 Looks Like Gold, and Derek Tastes of Wax. And this is the amazing world of synesthesia and the lessons that it may teach us about cognitive perception. As always, I want to start with some housekeeping. Uh, you're watching on Facebook, so please um, put any comments, uh, likes and questions on there. I will answer all the questions right at the end and uh, it will take me about 45 to 50 minutes to go through the talk, depending on how much I waffle. And if you're watching this on YouTube after it's been recorded and uploaded, please do um, send in your comments as well. If you're a tweeting person, then do tweet and hashtag me. We've also got an Instagram account um, and other accounts which are really new, so um, I will let you have those next time. And uh, you will know that this is now series three of my talks, and it's the second one in series three. Recordings of all my talks are uploaded onto a YouTube uh, channel that I've created. And if you subscribe to that channel, which is completely free, you will get a notification of all my talks or each talk as it's uploaded. So please do share that. Now I wanted to say welcome. And in fact, although this is very similar to previous screens, I've added one more welcome. The one right in the middle is in Nepali. And it's welcome in Nepali because last week we had, as far as I know, our first Nepali um, viewers. Um, I think Carl is in Kathmandu and he is, uh, I think, teaching there. So hello to Carl and the people in Nepal. His, um, the spread of people that seem to listen to these talks, which is great. And as I've said before, if your country isn't represented here, then do let me know because I like colouring in. I always start my talks with the thank yous, just so that you know that this is a big team effort rather than just me. So I want to thank the people who've made all of this happen. And that is these wonderful people who are um, many students of mine as, and assistants. So Oscar Nocton is a lovely young man who's in our first year who helps with all the technical stuff. Then um, the three ladies at the top are Nyanika, Claudia and Priyanka who've been helping me with the content for this talk. And then uh, along the bottom, we've got Anisha, Andrea, Lucy, Ida and Kim, who help with taking questions, but also on the technical side of things with our web page, et cetera. So without these people, I would not be able to give this talk. So thank you to all of you in advance. As an overview for the talk, I'm going to just briefly talk about what a sensation is. And then I'm going to go into this strange world of synesthesia. And I'll ask that intriguing question of whether we're all synesthetes at some level. And I'll follow that up with what causes synesthesia and then possibly about application to the other 98% of us, but that's going to take some time. Um, so I'm just going to briefly mention that. So linking to last week's talk about um, mental imagery, I talked about sensory experience and the fact that our five senses take information in and because of the hard wiring of the brain, that information is processed in different parts of the brain. So for example, our eyes are directly linked to the back of the, the brain to an area called the occipital cortex and that's where vision starts off. It's not the only place for vision, but it's, that's where it starts off. Um, there's a kind of Alice band that goes across the head here, which is where we receive information about touch or what we call proprioception. And um, so when you touch something, the information goes to that yellow area in this diagram. And you see that there are areas for hearing, taste, smell. Now, for 98% of us, this is how things work and we know mostly how um, it's all plumbed, how things connect to one another and 
at least at some level, how that sensory experience of touching something, hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting, results in the experience that we have. So what is multisensory perception? So by multisensory perception, I'm moving away from the idea of this thing looking like something to you. This is a unisensory perception because you see this and you get a visual experience from it. But what about anything beyond that? So does the letter A make you see red? Has a song ever brought colors before your eyes? Literally in terms of seeing colors when you hear music. Does the taste of your favorite dessert bring the feeling of cold sharpened steel to your fingertips? Is Monday yellow, orange, Thursday orange or other colors? Is uh, January pink, etc.? And does the name Derek taste like earwax? Now these all sound like complete bonkers questions. And to most of us, they are bonkers questions because most of us, boring people, we experience or suffer from unisensory perception. So this thing we see, full stop. The water we taste, full stop. My voice you hear, full stop. But multisensory perception involves getting at least two for one. And that's what synesthesia is, it's mixing of senses. So it comes, the term comes from Greek roots and just like last week, um, there's a little Greek lesson here. So the Greek root syn means together and esthesia is sensation. So today, together what we have is a coming together of senses or commonly thought of as the union of senses rather than a one-to-one -one mapping. Instead, you get more than one-to-one. -one. Now it can be what's known as intramodal, which means that a visual sensation can give you another visual sensation. And I'll give you an example in a while, but it can also be intermodal between senses. And I'll give you examples of that as well. Now, importantly, synesthesia is more than just metaphors because things like does um, uh, a song make you see color? You can think of songs as having different auras and colors in terms of moods, etc. But synesthesia is not a metaphor. It's an actual perception and sensation. So it's more than things like bright sounds or sharp tastes, which are metaphors that have developed in our communication system to give us a, a richer way of communicating with one another. So if I say a bright sound, you know that it's not going to be a thud. If I say a sharp taste, it's not going to be a boring taste without much to it. It's going to have a lot of quality to it. But those phrases aren't synesthesia, they're simply metaphors. So what is this thing? Now, here's a, a definition um, of synesthesia as occurring when stimulation of one sensory modality automatically triggers a perception in a second modality in the absence of any direct stimulation to this second modality. Now, I know you've seen that name Baron Cohen before, but it is not um, Borat or Ali G. It's actually his cousin. Um, Sasha Baron Cohen's cousin, uh, Professor Simon Baron Cohen, who is uh, a leading light in this area. He's also one of the world experts in autism research and he's at Cambridge University. And he's one of the early researchers in this field, which really is only 25 or so years old in terms of proper good research. And so this is a, a very a seminal quote from Simon's work. Earlier than that, uh, Richard Saitovic, I think um, is his first name, talked about taste and smell that can lead to a tactile experience. And I'll give you an example in a moment. And then Marx in 1997 talked about sound and music that can be seen in color. And the term colored hearing came into usage in the early 2000s. And this is where seeing spoken or written words 
um, and letters results in color. In terms of prevalence, which means how many people experience it in the general population, there are lots of different numbers. So Cytowic in the, one of the earliest papers suggests one in every 25,000. So that suggests a very rare condition. Then um, Simon Baron Cohen's work, which is a, a more systematic large scale study suggested one in 2000. So it was a, a 10 times as, as, as much as Cytowic had suggested. Then Ramachandran, um, who's a neurologist in San Diego, um, went a bit more liberal and suggested that it's one in 200. More recently, there's a suggestion that it's 2% of people. So one thing is certain, the number two is there somewhere. It's either one in 20,000, one in 2,000, one in 200, or 2%, or one in 50. Now, that sounds very similar to the number I said last week for um, optic amorphia and also for developmental prosopagnosia. So is this the correct number? We don't really know. And this is why large scale research is always important because as you'll see in um, the differences between the Cytovic study and the Baron Cohen study, there's a factor of 10. Now the second one is, was a large scale study whereas the first one will have been when no one had heard of this, this phrase. So um, trying to find people who had the condition will have been more difficult. So it may be that in five years time, we'll have to adjust our um, numbers of what we think. So demographically, who experiences synesthesia? There's supposed to be a female to male ratio, such that about five and a half women to every male um, in, in that 2%. But these numbers are always being revised as more and more studies are being done. Now it is, it is found more in artists, painters, composers, and writers. So Van Gogh, for example, various composers, uh, Chopin Liszt, um, writers, Nabokov, and then uh, modern day um, artists, Lady Gaga, Pharrell Williams, um, Billy Eilish, um, Billy Joel, um, lots of current people who are successful in their art also have synesthesia. Now, whether it's a chicken and egg thing, we don't really know, but there seems to at least be some sort of connection, but the people are trying to work out what that connection is. But there are many different forms of synesthesia, so I'm going to give you a bit of a flavor for those now. So we can have colored time units, so um, days of the week, etc. Musical sounds and notes and general sounds can have color, spoken words like Monday. Um, tastes can have color, odors, pain, even personalities, touch, temperatures can have color. Um, smell can have sounds, tastes, um, sorry, sounds, tastes, temperatures, and touch can elicit a sense of smell. And similarly, a smell, a taste, a temp some temperature or touch can elicit a sound. Now, some of these forms are more rare than the, the classic one, which is colored hearing, but uh, uh, many of these combinations have been documented, even if they're quite rare. As an example of the most common one, which we, it, which is technically called grapheme color, but that's what um, the earlier term colored hearing was. Here's the alphabet of one synesthete. So for this synesthete, A was a peach, peachish color and A had a uh, gender, A was a boy. B was also a boy, but was a light blue, while C was a bit, is a tomboy who's yellow. D is a boy who's a darker red. M is a Midwestern boy, not just any boy, but a Midwestern boy. Um, P is a pretty girl. Um, Let's see, what else have we got? Um, S is also blue, like, like B, but it's a boy who's pretty nice, whereas B is just a boy. So you see this um, quite a lot of um, speci specificity here. Now, the thing is that this will have been for just this one person. And if you're a synesthete and uh, you're watching this, you're probably shrieking in horror saying, no, 
A is A is green or it's uh, magenta or something like that, and A is definitely not a boy. Now that's because each synesthete's um, synesthetic experience is different, and that's one of the things that we're trying to understand. What is it that causes synesthesia? But then, what causes all these individual differences? Another one is gustatory tactile, and this is the one of the first that was documented by Cytovic. And this is his synesthete MW, he sa who said, with an intense flavor, the feeling sweeps down my arm and I feel weight, texture, its shape, and whether it's warm or cold, like I'm actually grasping something. So this, so this man actually had this physical sensation when he ate things and it felt like he was holding something. So he was getting that tactile experience from his taste, his gustation. Another um, well-documented one is time-space, and this is an intriguing one. This is where people see time in a physical space around them. And so, and this will vary between people. So for this person, um, June is in front of them and towards the left, September is right in front of them, and August is to the side of September. October is more towards the right, whereas January is behind them. Some of these people will see years in a space around them, centuries in the space around them, etc. And again, this will vary incredibly between people, but that, um, fit, that um, abstract concept of time actually has a physical reality in space for them. Another really intriguing form is called mirror touch synesthesia. And I was going to try to find a, a video for you, but I wasn't able to do so. In mirror touch synesthesia, an individual will claims to experience a sensation when they see someone else being touched. So in this representation, what we had, this is just a mock-up. What we have is a person in the foreground whose um, index finger is being pricked with a, a special caliper and the person in the background is simulating what a synesthete would do but they would probably have a blindfold on so they couldn't see some it, no actually they wouldn't have a blindfold they'd be seeing that but they would actually say that they felt that experience in their um, index finger as well um, if a synesthete, for example, sees is looking at someone and that person is stroking their cheek like this, the synesthete will say that they feel their own cheek being stroked. Now, um, research has demonstrated that people with mirror touch synesthesia might be high on empathy, and it, there is a link possibly between how we experience the outside world and play it back in our own um, brain through things that are called mirror, touch, mirror neurons. Now, I don't know this area well at all, so I just wanted to make you aware that this exists. Another one is colored sounds, and this is quite an intriguing one. And this is where people see music in color. I heard a really lovely uh, thing, uh, I think it was on a radio program where, Someone said that um, when they were younger, they assumed that, that when they went to concerts, the reason that the lights are turned down when the band or the orchestra is about to play was that, so, that, so that the darkness allowed everyone to see their colors properly because that person was a synesthete and the different um, aspects of the music would elicit the colors for them the sounds would give them colors and they could see those colors better when it was dark. And they assumed that that was the reason that the lights are dimmed at the start of a concert. And they didn't realize that 98% of people around them did not um, have the same experience, but that was their understanding. This is a painting by a lady I met a number of years ago called Jane McKay, who um, paints different um, types of music. And she's got a whole series of paintings of Tchaikov Tchaikovsky's piano concerti, and each one is different. Now, importantly, this is different from someone 
who says this the feeling I have this is actually what Jane sees when she's hearing Tchaikovsky Tchaikovsky's first piano concerto, and it will be different to what she sees when um, she hears the second piano concerto, for example. Um, so it's important to note that this isn't a feeling she has, she literally sees these colors. And finally, we've got sound gustatory, and this is an odd one. It's, uh, um, th this is a quote from James Wanerton, who used to be the president of the UK Synesthesia Association. And he said, Every sound I hear, especially word sound, comes with an involuntary taste and texture experience attached. This is a real mouthfeel and not just a simple association. If I hear my dog bark, I experience the taste and texture of runny custard in my mouth. The word like tastes of yogurt. The name Martin has the taste and texture of a warm bakewell tart. Individual voices have taste and texture as does all music, what does normal actually mean? So um, what you, we see here are really strange connections between sounds and words. And there isn't a, any uh, discernible mapping from what the word is to the meaning. So the word like tasting like yogurt, for example, I don't know how that comes about. One day we'll find out about the moment we learn. There is an odd one that I've been told about, and I hope Helen Kitching doesn't mind me saying this, but Helen Kitching is one of, one of our viewers who um, apparently helped set up the UK Synesthesia Association in the 1990s. And she was working at a hospital, and I can't remember which hospital she said, and she said she met a woman who um, experienced colors for orgasms. Um, I'm just gonna leave that there. Right. So the next question is, how real is this experience? Is there a perceptual reality to it? So thus far, I've been telling you about these bonkers things where the word like taste of yogurt and Jane sees piano concerti in colors and, and sight of X man um, feels shapes when he eats something. But how do we know that that's actually real um, rather than just a kind of, uh, a healthy imagination, let's say. So that's where psychologists and particularly cognitive psychologists try to evaluate what someone is talking about as their experience and trying to work out whether there is a real reality to it. And one way to do it is a very classic um, cognitive test, which looks at how automatic we we are in some responses and it uses words or numbers written in colored ink and it's known as the Stroop effect and uh, lots of psychology students will know this. Some of you may have come across it but in case you don't this is how it works. So we see this word here and I want you to tell me what color the ink is and in this case the color of the ink is red. Now, in this case, I want you to tell me what the color of the ink is, and here the color is green. Now, the reason that, that is used is because I imagine that you will find saying red here quicker than saying red here, sorry, green here. <laughs> and that's known as a congruency effect. So this is the type of graphs we would do in this type of research where congruent is where the color um, is the same as the word. So where the word red um, was written in the color red. Incongruent is where it's the word red, but the answer is green because you've got to name the color of the ink. So we've got congruent where the color of the ink is the same as the word itself and incongruent where the color of the ink is different. And the different score between the two of them is known as the congruency effect. So either you can see it as how much quicker it is when the word itself is the same as the color, or you can say it, see it as how much slower you are when you're thrown by the fact that, that the color of the ink is a different one from the word red. But ultimately it's about automaticity that 
it's actually really difficult for you to look at that um, the right hand version of red and not see the word red. You know that you've got to look at the ink color, but it's really difficult to ignore the word red. And that's because of our attentional processes and how we have to actually suppress reading that word. Okay, so why is this relevant? The reason it's relevant is because we're going to use that to look at synesthesia. So we can get a synesthete, and that's what they're known as, and show them this color, uh, this uh, black letter A. And we want to know what color it, it, that co letter is for them. And we can use um, this color mapping um, wheel and get them to pick which color out of all that big array that color is for them. And we might find out that for this synesthete, a is red. So red is congruent for this synesthete. And if we show them now a green A, then we know that that's incongruent because we know that for this person, an A is red, and yet we're showing them the A in green. So that's what we do in this sort of research. We work out what someone's congruent color is, and then we can use incongruent colors just like the red in red and green to try to work out how automatic that perception is. And there's something that we can do which is called a consistency test where we can ask them a few months later what color is A? And if, they, if they've just been making it up then we wouldn't expect them to say red that um, quickly. Yet what we find is that a synesthete months later, we'll get about 90% of the same colors. Whereas if I asked you to even try to remember what color A is a week later, you wouldn't do as well. So we know from the consistency that they show over large spans of time that these are real experiences for them. Now, what we did for this, and this was my first ever study in synesthesia hundreds of years ago, and um, I was helped on this by my lovely first PhD student, Mary Spiller, who's provided some of the um, information for this work. And what we did is to look at number synesthesia. And this is where people see numbers in different colors. So um, what we did is that we took people who reported synesthesia and we asked them what color their different numbers were. So we know, knew what color four was, we knew what color five was, et cetera, et cetera. And then we could basically mess around and we could, work, we could show them a congruent color and an incongruent color, et cetera, et cetera. And this is how it worked. So we would show them the four and then the pl a plus and then the five, and it's a math sum. But before they gave us the answer, which would be nine, they had to tell us what color this square was. Now, the way that we did this is that we knew that for um, one of our synesthetes, the color, the number nine was gold. Now, given that um, four plus five is nine, and we know that they're thinking of nine, then we show them a gold square, and we know that their nine is gold, so we expect them to be quicker. So the answer here would be gold, nine. So first of all, they give us the color of the square, followed by the answer to the maths question. So this would be a congruent trial, whereas if we knew that this person's nine was, was gold and we gave them a green square, they'd have to say green, nine. But we know that that green would throw them because their nine is actually gold. So that's how we would work. And these are the data from our study. And um, we've got three different synesthetes here. Um, they're DF, SB, and KD. And KD is um, actually one of my all-time favorite students from many years ago. So Kavis, if you happen to be watching this, I love you. What we have here is the congruency effect. A congruent, congruency effect of zero would basically mean there's no difference whatsoever. 
Whereas a positive congruency effect means that they were really slowed down if we'd messed around with the color of their square. And what we find is that for DF, SB and KD, we get these positive congruency effects. And importantly, for controls, so these were people who were the same age and gender as DF, so NCDF means the control person who doesn't have synesthesia that we use to compare DF against, NCSB for the control for Simon, et cetera, et cetera. And what we see for those NCs is that their congruency effects are hovering around zero. So to them, it didn't matter what color that square was. It didn't really throw them. Whereas for each of our synesthetes, we see a positive congruency effect. And importantly, we also see um, individual differences. So when we did this in the visual modality, the, what I've just shown you, we saw that DF had a really strong effect, whereas KD had less of an effect. Whereas in the auditory realm, where we actually played the sounds to them and then they just saw the square, we saw a different thing where for K KD, the effect was huge. Now, interestingly, KD, Kavos, um, used to be a professional violinist. So the auditory realm was very important to him. So this is an example of how by working out what the synesthetic experience is for an individual, we're able to show scientifically that that experience has a reality by using this intriguing Stroop effect. Now, those people that I've just told you about, they all have developmental synesthesia. So they've always had it. There's, there's nothing in terms of brain damage or anything like that that um, has been seen that um, suggests that that is the reason for their synesthesia. And this is an area just like um, the optic amorphia or aphantasia that I talked about last week, where there's a lot of research on developmental versions, but less on acquired because the acquired form is more rare. Now, I was fortunate enough to work on a study with my colleague Devin Terhoun on an intriguing case of face color synesthesia following a particular drug. Um, and I can't even remember the name of the drug, psychocybine, I think it is, but because I don't know anything about the drug itself. But this is, a, I think, a psychedelic drug that this um, young man um, reported taking quite a bit. And he said that he had um, face color synesthesia such that different faces gave him different colors. So we did a similar study with congruency. So we, we knew that certain faces gave him a blue uh, color, others gave him a red color, et cetera. So we knew what we could do with congruent and incongruent um, faces. And what we see here, it's, it's uh, not an easy graph to read. But the main thing is that when you look at controls, which are um, basically people without synesthesia, they're the green dots. For both the congruent and incongruent, what we get is that um, the, the error rate for the study that we were doing was relatively small, about 1% um, you know, error, where, and uh, it took them about 700 milliseconds to reply to this question that we were giving them. So for them, the important thing is that between the dark green and the red, the light green, congruent versus incongruent, there's no difference. But for our um, synesthete LW, you see a massive difference between the congruent, so this is like the gold square that was congruent with the number nine. Um, he, he was both fast, 600 milliseconds, 500 milliseconds, and very small error rate, but then when it was incongruent, so we put a different color on a face, an incongruent color, he had many more errors and his spread of reaction times, so how quickly he responded was much greater. So what we see here is face color synesthesia that is acquired because of um, this particular drug that he'd been taking. We've, I've also come across an example of auditory color synesthesia following brain damage. And this was to tones, not to words, but just hearing tones resulted <clears throat> in uh, a sense of color for this particular individual. 
And this is uh, uh, from brain scanning that was done on the individual. And this would be as if the person was looking down and towards the right. So you're looking at the back of their head and that, that kind of flat bit is basically as if you'd sliced off a part of the head about this sort of angle. Now, importantly, what we see um, in um, B, so on the right-hand side, is the activation for um, a non-synesthete, healthy control when you place certain tones. And this is in the auditory areas where we would expect you, your eye to hear sounds and this part of the brain we would expect to become activated because that is where, like that very first image I showed you of the five different senses, that's where we, we would be hearing sound. But on the left-hand side is uh, the patient. And what we see is that in addition to the auditory areas in the front, we also get activation in the back. And that area in the back where the orange dots are is the visual areas of the brain and particularly the areas where we see color. So what we see here is that at the level of studying the brain and brain activation, when we play sounds to this patient, he end that part of his brain that would be activated for seeing a color becomes activated even though he's not seeing a color. And so what we have here is a quiet synesthesia following brain damage. An important question which kind of links oddly and almost conversely to um, the talk on optic amorphia or aphantasia is whether you need an external image. So do you need to see the word Monday for that color to come about? And this is the work that Mary did for her PhD. And she explored whether synesthesia was possible from internally generated stimuli. So she developed a really lovely um, experiment where the generation of the stimulus was internal. We never said the word Monday or a particular letter or anything like that. We got the person to think about it. So they generated it in their mind's eye, which I know is a bit cruel to, to any of the people from, um, who have aphantasia or optic amorphia because you don't have that mind's eye. But that's what Mary was doing for people um, who do have a mind's eye, including these synesthetes. And what she wanted to see was, do you get synesthesia for that internal image of the letter R or the word Monday, etc.? And lo and behold, that's what she found, that for our synesthetes um, who are in the black bars, what we get is... Um, uh, these congruency effects. And I don't know if Roz RW is watching this, but Roz is one of our synesthetes there and we've got wonderful Cavus there again. So what we see here is that compared to the controls who are in the gray bars who are still hovering around zero, so basically no difference, for the synesthetes, when we get them to just think about a particular word or letter, we get that color. So you don't have to present something in the external world for them to have that experience of the color in, um, in a perceptual sense. So this is rather lovely work because it, it demonstrated that it's not about something that's physically outside in the world that generates the synesthetic color. It's the concept itself in the brain that is activating the color. So that brings us to brain-related activity. First of all, I'm going to show, tell you about functional magnetic resonance imaging or fMRI, and I've already shown you an example of that. Um, the details aren't important, but basically the concept behind fMRI is that um, when a part of the brain is becoming active, just like a body part that's doing exercise, it needs oxygen. And because uh, blood carries oxygen, it drags blood to it. So just like if you were running, your legs need oxygen. So blood is rushing down to your legs to allow you to, those muscles to work. And the blood is being pulled there because of the, the life-giving oxygen for those muscles. In exactly the same way, if uh, the, the 
visual areas of your brain are doing something because you're reading something, then the visual areas need oxygen, so they drag blood to it. And an fMRI uh, procedure is effectively measuring where the blood is accumulating in the brain. And the idea is that that must be because that part of the brain is quite busy at the moment and it needs blood to, for the oxygen. So that's what an fMRI <clears throat> scanner is. And this is a, a very early study um, by Nunn and colleagues. I think this was actually at Goldsmiths where I am now, but it was uh, quite a while ago. And what they did was they, they, they looked at um, people who were synesthetes on the left-hand side and non-synesthetes on the right-hand side. And what they did is um, uh, present uh, the words to these people, um, spoken words, not seen words, and they looked at brain activity. Now, the main thing here, and this, this is, uh, um, image is taken as if the person is lying back and so what you're doing is you're looking at the person like this and the back of their head is at the bottom and the top of their the front of their head is at the top so the the bottom part of these graphs it's as if you're slicing slicing like this the bottom part of the graph or figures is the back of the brain, which is the visual areas. And the most important thing is that those red dots, those red dots are in the areas of the brain that we know are important for color perception. We know this from lots of studies in physiology, et cetera, et cetera, and even patients who can't see color, that that area of V8 is important for seeing color. Importantly, no color was shown in this experiment. People were just hearing words. And what you see on the right-hand side is that the non-synesthetes or controls, of course, they're not seeing any color. So the color area of the brain is kind of asleep. So no oxygen is being dragged there. But for these people, what we see is that the color area becomes active. And that implies that when they say, I see a color when you say the word Monday, there's a reality to it because that part of the brain is becoming active. Another type of um, uh, brain imaging technique is known as uh, MEG or magnetoencephalography. And this is based on a slightly different uh, technique. And that's to do with the fact that our brains and actually a lot of what's happening within us is uh, functions on electricity electric signals are being sent around the brain and the body to allow us to do things. Now, um, without getting too physics about this, um, but I'm sure that the A-level students will appreciate this. Um, some of you might know that whenever there's an electric current, there's a magnetic field around the electric current. And what an MEG machine is doing is effectively picking up that Electric, electric current and the magnetic field. So right now, because I'm saying things, the speech areas of my brain are active and those speech areas of the brain are receiving electrical signals and those electrical signals are creating really tiny little magnetic fields around um, the, that speech area. And this picture make, looks, it's me. And this is in, I think, 2006. And it looks like I'm having my hair and nails done, but I'm not having my hair and nails done. I'm actually having an MEG scan. And that, what looks like a hair dryer, is actually um, uh, hundreds of electrical coils that are picking up the magnetic fields around my head. Now, the fields, uh, the magnetic fields are so small that the the room that I'm in has had to be heavily encased to make sure that it was blocking out any metal from outside because the metal would have picked up uh, picked up um, they've been picked up in these uh, coils. Now it's such that um, it, every bit of metal has to be taken out before you go into a scanner. Uh, I heard of uh, women who because of the 
particular makeup they were using, they couldn't have the scan because of the metals in some of the um, in some of the makeup. The coils are so sensitive uh, to vibrations and big amounts of metal that they can pick up a lorry if it's moving half a mile away. So it's really very, very, very sensitive. And the reason for this is because those magnetic fields are really, really tiny. So we use this to try to look at um, synesthetes to try to work out whether we could get information with this MEG system. Now, this is um, uh, an MEG scan of a control, so non-synesthete. Again, it's as if you're slicing across like this, um, and the top of the image is the front of the head, and the bottom of the image is the back of the head. And what you see in the control is that, again, where these are these um, uh, grapheme color synesthetes, where we were giving them words or letters, and the auditory cortex, the area that you hear things, that becomes activated, which is what we expect. However, in a synesthete, what we get is, first of all, that that area was not as active. Um, it's a bit complicated because this is about different types of brain waves. But, but the most important thing is that, just like the Nunn et al. study, the color areas of the brain were activated in our synesthetes in this MEG paradigm. So just like, um, just like the fMRI, we were able to pick up activity in the, in the color regions of the brain just when, when these synesthetes were hearing these words. So again, we, we've got more evidence for the perceptual and neural reality of um, synesthesia. Which brings me to the question, are we all sinners? Now, um, that is not to be offensive in any way, but um, this became mine and Mary's uh, term for anyone who's a synesthete because it just became a bit, bit, bit clumsy to constantly say the word synesthete, synesthete, synesthete. So we just call them sinners. So are we all sinners? So we looked at this. Um, in a study which was actually run by um, two greats of this field, um, Julia Simner and Jamie Ward, who are both at Sussex now. Uh, Jamie Ward is the person who actually got me into synesthesia research because um, 2003, I was at a conference. I didn't know many people. I saw Jamie was giving a talk about this word I'd never even heard of. So I went and listened and I thought, what? People see colors when they hear words. So after the talk, I went up to him and I chatted and I said, Jamie, where do you get your patients from? Because Jamie also started as a neuropsychologist working with people with brain damage. And so I assumed that these were patients. And he said, oh, they're not patients, they're students. And I said, what do you mean? He said, oh, the, the, you don't have to have brain damage to have this. Um, about 2% of people um, have synesthesia. So if you sent out an email to your students, you'd find some synesthetes. So just from that one conversation, that's where my journey in synesthesia started. So I'd like to thank Jamie for that. So here, what we wanted to do was to look at whether the experiences synesthetes have are completely random, and also whether non-synesthetes have some sort of experience. So first of all, um, in this study that uh, Jules, Jamie, and some others were running, they looked at um, the colors that synesthetes gave for different letters. And here, what you've got is for the grapheme A. So if people see or hear the letter A, what color do you get? And what you see is that the number of, of people who said red was quite high. Then um, blue, green, there are quite a few people who said yellow, uh, black, etc. So we see that in synesthetes, even though there is difference between synesthetes, there's a large percentage that think that the letter A is red. So it's not as random as we might have thought. Um, there is some order to this. Now, the, this then is the different colors 
that um, for different letters. So on the um, x-axis along the bottom, you've got different colors like black, white, red, yellow, etc. And along the y-axis going up, you've got the percentage of responses. So um, what you see is that uh, for, for the synesthetes generally, the letters U, I, and O were white, whereas J, S, M, R, and A were red. So that's mapping across synesthetes for all the different letters of the alphabet. But the other thing we did was we asked people who are not synesthetes what color these letters were. And it's a stupid question, weirdly, to ask someone, because um, why, why would you have a color for the letter A? But we said, just think of one. You know, just really think of anything that you associate with that color. So these group, this group were forced to choose from a list. And we said, just choose. And um, what you see is that the letter A came out as red, even for the people who are not synesthetes. So even people who are not synesthetes, if you force them, a lot of people would say, oh, okay, red, even though that doesn't mean anything to them. And then when you do free recall, where you just say, just do whatever you want, and even try to remember it later on, what we still see is a lot of consistency. It's not the same as the synesthetes, but what we see is that even in non-synesthetes, when we ask people, you know, I'm going to hold a gun to your head, you've got to choose a color for the letter A, and a color for the letter O, etc. And what we see, for example, um, for the letter O, a lot of people say orange. So there's some sort of correspondence, and some of it is because of associations like O for orange, etc. But others are, for example, A it might be red because it's it's such an important primary color for survival. So maybe we're all synesthetes at some, some level, or at least start as, as synesthetes. So that brings up the question, what causes the synesthesia? Is it fridge magnets? And I don't mean in a kind of cure non um, conspiracy way where, where all these um, magnets are, are frying people's brains and, and making them synesthetes. It's these things. So some of you will have had um, uh, fridge magnets or your parents will have had fridge Fridge magnets when you were growing up to try to teach you letters of the alphabet. So for this family, A was green and B was pink and C was orange, etc. So is it that um, it's fridge magnets? Um, so that's known as the fridge magnet hypothesis. Um, unlikely. Although for some people that might be it, and this is about an association, it's not really the case. So, for example, Cavus, uh, the lovely, wonderful Cavus, uh, uh, at least one of his siblings was also a synesthete, if not a couple. And unless their family was buying fridges and magnets every time they had a child and they were different, and each child had their own fridge and their own magnets, um, they, they, the colors of these letters were all were consistent. And yet for each of the synesthetes in the family, the colors were different. Whereas if it was about fridge magnets, unless the family was having one set of fridge magnets for Cavus and another one for his sister, etc., cetera, um, and therefore each was remembering their own fridge magnets, that couldn't have been the case. So the fridge magnet hypothesis doesn't work. A more plausible one is um, called neural cross activation. And this is to do with the fact that the areas of the brain that are, uh, are visual and which have color are next to one another. So this boxing glove diagram is again of the brain, um, the front of the brain is on the left and the back is on the right. And what we find is that the area of the brain where we see letters and the area of the brain that where we see color are actually quite close to one another. And one of the suggestions was that what's happened is that these two areas which are quite close to one another have some, somehow bled into one another and um, stimulating one area is stimulating another. 
Now, there are suggestions, and I've been away from this literature for a while. Um, it's only because of these talks that I, I decided to give a talk about synesthesia, and it's kind of got me excited again about this area. Um, so I've been away from this for a little while, but there was a suggestion um, when I was working in the field 10 or so years ago that actually we all start as synesthetes and our senses are multiply linked to one another. But as, our, as we um, go from babyhood into toddlerness, et cetera, what happens is that the brain kind of decides that when you see this thing, you only need a visual feeling for it. And when you drink it, you only need a taste feeling for it. So it says, I don't need to see the water or um, have a shape for the water. I just need to taste it. I don't need the color for the water. I just need to taste it. So what happens is that those other connections to the other modalities get pruned away. So it's called synaptic pruning, where the connections that we all started with have been um, pruned away so that most of us are left with this one-to-one -one mapping and a unimodal experience. Now, I don't know where what the state of play is with that work, but that's certainly what the, what the suggestion was at the time. However, whilst that is a compelling explanation for colored hearing, for example, um, it doesn't really explain some of the other things like why Derek tastes of wax because the the um, the letter area is nowhere near the taste area. So um, it might explain some, but not all. Another thing to look start looking at is what are the links to other conditions or other cognitive abilities? Now, Jill Simner and her colleagues, because she's a, a, a really smart linguist, they've been looking at children with grapheme color synesthesia because a lot of the research has tended to be done on adults because it is easier to work with adults, which I know most of you would probably agree with. <laughs> the, uh, they worked with children with grapheme color synesthesia and they, they found that these children had real cognitive strengths in their vocabulary and their self-evaluated reading. And a link to last week would be that having a mental image could be used as a memory technique. And I know that Andrew Sheldon, who's one of the um, people with optic amorphia that I met as a result of last week's talk, said to me that, that he could see that I had an advantage relative to him because I've got, I used to have a bit of photographic memory and just be able to see my lecture notes. And he said he didn't have anything there whatsoever. So could it be that being able to see colors along with the words might help with the reading or vocabulary? And um, there are suggestions that some synesthetes have got numbers, uh, colored numbers, that they're much better at mathematics. I know that, um, Simon, who was one of the synesthetes in our first study, said that his teachers thought that he was cheating because he used to know the answers to maths sums so quickly that they thought there's no way you can know that. And he said, well, the color's right. Of course, they thought he was bonkers, but he wasn't, he's a synesthete. So there might be implications in the classroom, possibly. We don't know, but there might be implications. The next thing is that, what does synesthesia tell us about non-synesthesia, about other things? Now, the, this is very new work, and um, so it's speculative, but it's a start. And this is work led by uh, a group in Nijmegen in Holland, but which does include um, Jamie and Jules from Sussex, where they started to look at genetic studies and also other psychological traits, such as schizophrenia and autistic spectrum disorder. Now, the reason for this is that um, there has been, have been links in the past drawn between autistic spectrum disorder and schizophrenia, sorry, autistic spectrum disorder and synesthesia. But recently, the fact that um, synesthetes have this perceptual experience was thought to be at least a, 
at some level a parallel with the fact that some people with synesthesia see things or hear things which had always been seen as an aberrant, uh, aberrant sorry, um, experience. So someone with synesthesia, schizophrenia is seeing or hearing things and we're, seeing that, we're saying that there's something wrong with that and that there's a, met, there's, there's a problem there. And yet when a synesthete experiences it, we're not saying that that's a problem. So uh, I don't want to get into the rights and wrongs and whether it's a problem or not, but the fact that there are experiences, sensory experiences, is interesting. So in this study, which is very complicated, so I'm not going to go into the details, what they looked at is two psychological uh, characteristics, schizotypal traits. So that means not people with schizophrenia, but what type of uh, traits that go along with things to do with schizophrenia, but which we all have. We've all got those. We've all got depressive traits, etc. Um, so this isn't an amount that would make give someone a diagnosis, but it, it's things that um, are along a, a schizophrenia uh, spectrum and also autistic traits. And then they took a physical trait, body ma mass index, which has got nothing to do with perceptual experience because they wanted to compare it with something that's got nothing to do with sensory experience. And what they found is that synesthesia and autistic spectrum disorder do share some features, which is what had been suggested before. But possibly there are stronger links to atypical sensory sensitivity and a bias towards detailed processing, which is a hallmark of, of schizotypal traits. So what we're seeing here is a, a, a link to other sensory experiences. So these findings may help to improve the quality of life of people with autistic spectrum disorder and can direct research efforts into understanding and treating sensory dysregulation. Of course, this is new work, but I think it's really interesting, promising and exciting. Now, finally, um, I just want to say that new work is beginning to try to look at these things and see how we might expand beyond just studying schizophrenia synesthesia and see how it can help us generally in the outside world. So for example, the mirror touch work that I talked about earlier, the you know, feel, feeling someone, uh, the stroking of the cheek um, when you see someone else see, having that happen to them, that's giving us inroads into understanding empathy. Michael Banasi, who's one of my colleagues and who's a leading light in this uh, area of of empathy and mirror touch synesthesia. Um, he said that work is beginning to look at how training nurses with learning from what we're learning about empathy is really helping for their work with their patients. Of course, this is new work and it will take some time. He also said that apparently architects in Holland are beginning to design buildings with knowledge of colors that seem to be ones that people tend to uh, respond well to, etc. All of this is all new stuff and if it will take a long time before we can understand it further. Okay, so finally, as a summary, we find that some individuals experience multi-sensory multi perception. This mixing of senses can happen in a number of different combinations, and while some combinations are, are very well mapped, others are, um, a bit, are quite rare. Many individual differences exist, so you can have two uh, um, synesthetes going hammer, at to hammer and tongs about what colour A or Monday is, because everyone's got a different experience. Um, research has demonstrated that there is a perceptual reality to these experiences. They're not, they're not just ideas. So our four plus five looks like gold study, for example. And then brain activation has shown that there is a neural reality of these subjective reports. It's not something that they're just saying. We can find uh, uh, signatures of that in the brain. And then finally, some evidence is pointing to all of us being somewhat synesthetic, and maybe we all started as, as synesthetes but lost that ability, and then new research is beginning to show the links to other behaviours, abilities and conditions. So, um, uh, finally, just a little advertisement for my research group, Art. 
um, we are going to get into synesthesia research and linking it with our prosopagnosia and aphantasia research. Um, but if you also want to take part in any of our memory research or our executive function research, do get in touch with us at this email address, art.gold.mind at gmail.com. And if you can, please include this information, your name, your age, your gender. And if you do have any neurological conditions such as epilepsy or cognitive difficulties such as dyslexia or even a strength, if you're particularly good with the memory or face recognition, if, you, uh, if you're a synesthete, et cetera, then do tell us about it. You can find out more about my research team by visiting our, our website here. So I want to thank you. I want to thank my fantastic team of helpers. Um, it seems that my next talk is going to be a week today um, and it's going to be on art and the brain, music, painting and dance. Now in um, our survey that we did asking what people thought about and what they, what they thought about my talks and what they wanted more of, one of the things was more pictures of my mum. So here you go. This is a picture of my darling mummy when we took her back to Zanzibar where she was born. Uh, she was born there in 1938, but my grandfather moved the family from Zanzibar to um, uh, Kenya when she was about three years old. So at the, at the lovely age of 69 years old, we took her back to Zanzibar to where she was born. And this is on a a tour of the spice plantations in Zanzibar. So there you go. For those uh, the fans of my mummy, there she is. Thank you very much. I'm now going to go and make a quick cup of tea and then I will be coming back to take questions. So please um, do send in your questions to my lovely team and I'll be back in a couple of minutes. Okay, I think I'm back. Um, just check that the sound is there. Okay, uh, thank you for letting me make my life-giving cup of tea. So let me see what questions we've got here. Um, my friend Debbie uh, from Choir has said, I know there's a link with dyslexia, but long time since I read about it. Uh, that's not a question, Debbie. I don't have uh, an idea about that, I'm afraid. Uh, I don't know about a link between dyslexia and um, synesthesia, I'm afraid. So Kim has asked, uh, do these lex lexical gustatory synesthetes recognize all their tastes or are some unfamiliar? Really good question, uh, Kim, because if I understand Kim's question properly, what she's saying is that for those people who taste these words, are the tastes ones that they already know? Or are, they, are there tastes that are just alien to them? Now, the reason that that's important is that if it's only taste that they're already familiar with, what that would suggest is that the link from the word to the taste is effectively a memory related issue where they've had a taste of something let's say tamarind, this is a lovely example, which takes me back to my childhood. And in fact, I used it in a casserole yesterday. Um, that taste of tamarind is there somewhere and somehow it gets associated or linked to a word because of these, this cross activation. Whereas if the tastes are unfamiliar, then it implies that it's not because of someone's experiences beforehand, but just that the taste part of the brain has been activated and there's, it's just completely random. It's a really lovely question, Kim. Guess what? I haven't got a clue. Not even the beginnings of a clue. Um, part of that is because I didn't, haven't studied those people because it is one of the more rare ones. Um, I could find out from James Wonerton if you'd like. Right, so what's the next question? Um, Kim has also asked whether there are cases of acquired synesthesia. Um, I think uh, Kim maybe asked that before uh, I got to the acquired synesthesia part. There are cases, uh, they're quite rare. And um, the important thing here is always to make sure that it's not 
um, it's a proper synesthesia rather than a simple substitution because they've lost a sense. So this, the studies are few and far between. They are there. The, that um, brain activation one that I showed you, that actually was after the patient had had a particular brain trauma and it was verified that it was a proper synesthesia. So they do exist, but they're very rare. Okay, Jonathan Gossage has asked, hello, Jonathan from Canada, I think. Are known cases of synesthesia always between two senses or are there known cases of either one to many or many to many connections? Um, I think I answered that one, Jonathan. I said that, that um, it's not always between two senses or maybe I didn't. Um, it's a very idiosyncratic. So um, just like with the previous talk on a Fantasia stroke optic amorphia, um, there's severities or, or um, levels. So some people only have it for the classic ones. So for the words and the letters, etc., And they don't have all those words that taste of something or tasting something that makes them feel physical shapes, etc. So, so there are some people who are more kind of average synesthetes for whatever that means. And then there's others who've got lots and lots going on. And that's actually quite an interesting question at some level, because um, I think Mary, Mary Spiller said to me that um, there is debate about what's happening with these people. And for some synesthetes, it's just a kind of a nice quirk. Oh, look, there's a color red. I see that whenever I hear Monday. For, for some, uh, and maybe those artists, it's a fantastic thing and it adds a perceptual um, layer to their lives, which us 98% uh, mortals just don't have. But for some people, it actually becomes a hindrance. Um, I did watch a, a video many years ago of a lady who, um, who had, I think, visual experiences when she, uh, no, she uh, sounds made her see things and the other way around as well. Um, bright lights made her hear things. And she lived in the countryside where a bird chirping was a pleasant thing. Um, but she was taken to Piccadilly Circus in the center of London and all the sounds of taxis, people, et cetera, et cetera, was just way too much for her. So I think that that one-to-one -one mapping and also the number of different um, connections, I think is something that varies hugely between people. And I think for some people where they've got many different things going on, it may become uh, an, an impediment rather than something that actually helps them. So you can see how it goes from a scale of, yeah, I know I've got synesthesia, but it really, doesn't really affect me much. And then there's others who really use it. And we're seeing that some of the kids who've got synesthesia, it can actually help their reading, et cetera. And then you get people for whom it's an actual hindrance. I hope that answered your question. Okay, the next question um, from Mohammed Asad. I don't know where Mohammed you are. Um, please tell us where you are in your questions because I'd like to know whether you're in the next street from me or in a different hemisphere. It's always nice to know. <clears throat> so Mohammed says, not really a, a related question, but I'm doing my A-levels and for most of my life, I've used things like colors and sounds to remember whatever it is I need to learn. For example, specific sentences or words would be assigned a color in my head. And I just learned the colors. And by doing that, I'd remember the words. Would that be considered a type of synesthesia? Or it's just a normal memory technique. Um, that's a nice question, Mohammed. So Mohammed saying that for remembering things, he'd, he'd try to link something that he was trying to remember to a color or a sound, and then he would use that to remember things. Um, I think that that is actually just a really good memory technique. Uh, and 
the synesthesia is completely involuntary. They, they're not thinking about it, it just happens. And this is why the Stroop effect uh, example shows you that it's, it's uh, uh, an automatic response. But what you're doing is actually an excellent memory technique. Um, uh, th there's something that you may have come across in your studies called chunking, which is how you can uh, bring lots of information together so if you think of, um, uh, let's just give an example, you're trying to remember five, five um, different animals and you think of the color white for those five animals. And you then have another set of animals that you're trying to remember and you assign the color green to them and you've got five there. And you have another set of animals that you assign the color brown to. And maybe the brown, the brown is for the brown animals, the green is for green animals, et cetera, et cetera. Now, eventually, what you can get is you've got your white, your green, and your brown. And those are just the three colors you've got to remember. If you can remember your white, green, and brown, you've only got three things to remember. Because once you remember those three, you then say, oh, white is those five animals, green is those th those th five, and um, brown is those five. So what you're doing there, um, if you brought your colors and things like that together, would be called chunking, where you're, you're using um, a technique of bringing information together to make it easier to remember. So I hope that answers your question, and good luck with your studies. OK. Um, Viv Alice asks, can the different colors or tastes, etc., also be linked to emotions? For example, can being happy or green be, uh, or uh, sorry, can being happy be green or taste sweet, or is it only senses which become linked? Let me see. Can different colors or tastes also be linked to emotions? Um, I'm not sure about that. Uh, I dare say that there, that there can be those links. But I would say that that's, that's going away from a perceptual world um, where synesthesia is a coming together of these different sensory modalities, which are you know, brought in by our five senses, whereas emotion is a, is a different thing. So, so whilst there might be some links there, I don't think that that would be considered synesthesia. And, and you saw that, that it's um, very, very, very random. So the word, like uh, for James Wonerton, tastes of yogurt. I mean, there's nothing about those four letters or the sound that would make you think of yogurt. Um, so it's a, a very kind of random kind of pairing. So I don't think the emotion side would be, but you know, I stand to be corrected. Um, so Paul Jenkins, who I know, who's one of our um, participants with prosopagnosia has asked, could my prosopagnosia be cross-linked to my ability to link unrelated things, which is um, alleged to be um, schizoindicative? Um, I doubt it. I think I think you're getting you're uh, uh, linking things that aren't linked there because pros uh, I haven't seen anything that suggests that things to do with prosopagnosia could be linked to. Um, schizotypal traits. Um, with prosopagnosia, it's very much in that one sensory modality. It's the visual. And I know that your memory is fine. Uh, your your um, um, hearing of my name or me saying something is still okay. So it's only seeing me that, that throws you and seeing this bit. Um, and whereas with the link between the synesthesia and the schizotypal uh, trait is to do with those senses and how those senses are heightened or, or um, reduced at some level. So I don't think that there'd be a link. Again, like Viv, I stand to be corrected. Uh, as Graham Norton says, we're not experts, <laughs> ask an expert. I am a kind of expert, but this is, I'm just getting back into this area of schizophrenia, not schizophrenia, synesthesia. Um, so I don't think it is linked to uh, prosopagnosia. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, 
Oh, Kim's asked an interesting question. Does the font make a difference to the color experienced? I am not sure. I I wonder if Mary is listening. Uh, Mary might have an answer to that. Um, I seem to remember that that whether something was written in capitals or not could impact things. And the thing is that that again here, it might for one person, but not for someone else because of the idiosyncrasies involved here. So um, I'm not sure, but um, I think for some people it may do, um, but not 100% certain. Mandy Wood, who uh, is a, a psychology teacher by profession and who runs a great organization and has got us quite a following uh, with her psychology teachers, etc., has, has asked, are there any links between synesthesia and ADHD, i.e. cognitive overload um, due to multisensory overload? Um, I haven't heard of any, but that doesn't mean that they don't exist. Um, I don't know whether I would consider it sensory overload. Uh, I know that I mentioned um, in response to Jonathan's question that um, for some people who've got so many synesthetic experiences that uh, it, it can become uh, an impairment for some of them. But I don't know if it's, um, if it's like an ADHD where it's a sensory overload. So I don't know, but it's, uh, it's an interesting question. Um, and then Mandy continues and says, but with schizophrenia, people lack insight to their condition, right? They believe the sensory experience is real, whereas in synesthesia, the person is aware that the additional sensory experience is part of their consciousness and not external stimuli. So is this about cultural narrative and contribution? Uh, I'm not even going to touch that second part about cultural narrative, etc. It's, it's not my bag, and I don't think I can answer that one at all. Um, in terms of consciousness, uh, uh, yes, I think that, the, that there probably is something there in terms of how our experiences, sensory, etc., involve filters. So right now, I'm, I'm experiencing things. The, the room is feeling a bit cool. Uh, because uh, I don't know whether the heating's gone off or not. Now, I can filter out that sensory experience or I can really pay a lot of attention to it. And that's what our attentional mechanisms do. I also have thoughts going on in my head, even while I'm speaking. Um, but my filter allows me to keep those, that, those thoughts down because right now I need to answer your question. And there is a thought that in schizophrenia, that um, filtering mechanism has um, got at least some dysfunction to it. And I don't work in schizophrenia, so I'm telling you about as much as I know. But if that filter is uh, somewhat damaged or not working well, then those senses or um, those thoughts, et cetera, can uh, invade. Maybe with synesthesia, that filter is also not working well, or it's kind of letting more through. Um, and maybe it's the case that there are certain combinations that get through that result in more difficult thinking, etc. So as I said, that, that work about the schizotypal um, trait is really new. So it's going to be a case of watch this space, I'm afraid. Jonathan has asked, um, when we talk about links to color, are the colors mostly broad spectrum or do hues become important? The very good question, Jonathan. From what Mary was telling me yesterday, um, even when I say red, I, there'll be synesthetes who'll say, what do you mean red? It's much more this red than that red. So um, the, even that use of the word red is me using our sense of red, whereas for that synesthete, that red, is very specific and it might be a shiny red. So it's not even the color, it's a texture of red. So I think that um, uh, this is an example of how we have this shared understanding of the word red, but actually it's not, it's not as 
clear. We think we know what red is, but for that synesthete, red is way more than what we think it is. So I think that there's a lot more to it than, than we think of it. So thank you for that question, really nice. Um, okay, We're, and Mohammed has said, could hearing things at different volumes, loud or quiet sounds, etc., cause different levels of taste? For example, can louder sounds cause something to be sweeter than if it was said quietly? I think it probably would. I think that there's there's probably a threshold to these things, such that um, uh, you have to be able to perceive them because if. Uh, for someone who's who's hearing something, maybe uh, you know the word Monday uh, and seeing the color red, it needs to be at a threshold. I presume whether the intensity of the red changes, I don't know. In terms of the taste of that word, um, I wonder, but I don't. Uh, I don't know. Um, again, really nice questions here. Uh, I tried to do a study a number of years ago where we tried to look at. Um, at taste and music. And uh, we did find that there were correspondences between different, some tastes and certain aspects of at, at least musical pitch. Um, but I don't think the volume mattered. I think it was more the, the kind of sharpness or the, the kind of dullness of, of the sound. Um, and since I haven't worked in this area, I've only just worked in the quite boring grapheme colour synesthesia. I, I can't answer the questions on the more interesting, wacky ones. Okay, uh, I think that's um, all of the questions I've been sent through. Uh, so this is the point where I kind of waffle and uh, I just keep talking until I find out that there's no more questions or if someone is writing in a big thesis and I need to answer that. Um, there don't seem to be any more questions. Well, I hope that uh, you've enjoyed this uh, latest talk on synesthesia. If you're interested in our work, then do get in touch with us. Um, do follow us on social media. As I said, next week's uh, talk is a real departure for me. I've never done anything on art in the brain, but it was a it was a request that was made, and I thought, you know what? Maybe this is an opportunity for me to learn about music, painting, and dance. And I think I've got two little friends called Priyanka and. Um, Noonika, who seem to be quite good at finding it, things out for me. So I think I'm going to get together with my little friends and we're going to see what we can do for you on music, painting and dance. So um, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for my wonderful team of helpers and um, have an enjoyable rest of the evening. Goodbye. <laughs>